Hi, Jaron. Please introduce yourself. Hey, Alessandro. So uh, my name is Jeroen. Um, I'm the CTO and co-founder of Spire Global. I'm originally from Belgium, but I've kind of moved around a little bit since we started uh, the company and before that as well. My background's in aerospace engineering, spent a little bit of time at, uh, at NASA Ames, then essentially you know, started Spire, where uh, early on I was very hands-on in um, designing subsystems, building satellites, you know, being in the clean room, being in the labs, operating the satellites uh, and whatnot. Uh, but these days, um, I run together with our, our VP engineering and a couple of other folks, um, our space program with Inspire. So it's essentially you know, anything between sending up satellites and gathering data in orbit and um, delivering uh, any types of data or services to uh, internal customers, you know, business units that will then take that and turn it into uh, products and services um, or directly to external customers um, that are interested in raw data or in, in satellite services. What is your definition of new space? Everything that's based on, you know, challenging the, the previously used uh, kind of technologies or legacy technologies uh, in space, and that, you know, rides the wave of, of other types of industrialization, miniaturization and whatnot. So it's a, it's a pretty broad definition, but essentially anybody that, you know, kind of takes a different approach, approach to developing or deploying something from space or even exploiting data from space based on newly available modern technology that you know, wasn't available let's say a decade or two decades ago you know isn't really uh, doing it using the um, kind of legacy spacecraft approach um, and i think you know it, it it's not something that replaces legacy satellites i think it's it complements it because it, it brings different you know strengths and weaknesses to the table how can weather forecasts be improved uh, using small spacecraft? In my opinion, the benefit from small spacecraft is that you can have a lot, which means that you can have a global snapshot of, you know, of all kinds of measurements at any given time. So you have high revisit rates um, and that really changes things. So. Uh, for example, we provide radio occultation data, amongst other things. And so what we can get is a very uh, high temporal revisit time, a very high uh, density global coverage, very high quality data, even with a small satellite and a small sensor. And so uh, this data is then ingested in much larger volumes than, than was done previously in, uh, in weather models, and it improves the, uh, the performance of the, of the weather models. Um, it's not just this type of data, and, you know, it's... There's a lot, of, a lot of other things that can be done with small satellites um, that can be adjusted into weather models. You know, weather models assimilate all kinds of data coming from terrestrial sensors, um, geo satellites, LEO satellites, and whatnot. And every, you know, every type of sensor has its has its little part to play in improving the uh, uh, the performance. And you know, some sensors improve more the performance on the ground. Some sensors improve more at higher layers. So there's lots of different things that we can do to tweak the performance of these weather forecasts. And so radio occultation is one of them. But we are also looking at things like uh, GNSS reflectometry, which is looking at signals that bounce off the Earth's surface. Um, and you can deduce things like you know, soil moisture or ionospheric properties. Uh, looking, uh, looking with our GNSS sensors can be done as well. So th there's lots of other, other stuff that can be done. Jaren, I know that Spire offers a, a service of global tracking for uh, terrestrial assets. Can you tell us a bit more about it and why it's needed? This was uh, our first technical accomplishment, I would say, it was um, launching an AIS constellation. We were also always building you know, radio occultation and other sensors, but it was, it was kind of the first thing we got done. It was the first market we tried to enter, uh, and it was a really interesting one to us. So AIS is a ship tracking uh, technology. Um, so from space, you can pick up uh, beacons essentially from, uh, from all kinds of vessels and you can track where they are. Um, there's also terrestrial coverage, but obviously you can only get that you know, near coastlines. And the problems that existed were kind of twofold. It, it, it's one, you know, in, in terms of coverage in the open oceans, there's not, there wasn't really good coverage. You can, you can have that when you've got a, a large network of satellites that has a high revisit time. So um, there were existing legacy satellite data providers there. But for example, you'd have a you know, revisit time of maybe six hours or a couple of hours. And that's actually quite high. So in that time, a lot of stuff can happen. You know, if you're 
an insurance firm and you're looking at what happened with a collision or you're you're an NGO and you're looking at illegal fishing, you know, in six hours, a lot could happen. High revisit times are very important to us. So, so we, we started launching our constellation with that in mind. And then the second one was really more of a ground and processing aspect, which was processing uh, and access to the data. Can we really make this data available and easy to access and easy to introspect? to anybody, even people that you know are not at home in the maritime sector, don't really know uh, in detail what's, what, what is really an AS spec and standard um, and whatnot. Because the other thing you found with kind of legacy providers was that they, they were mostly selling raw data. You kind of get a fire hose of messages from these ships. And so if you're just interested in a few ships or just interested for kind of one aspect of your business, you're not going to spend you know, a whole bunch of effort building databases and filtering and data cleaning and whatnot yourself. So these are really the, the two reasons we entered into that market. And so we use our space data, we combine that with uh, terrestrial data and uh, dynamic AIS data, which is uh, AIS data captured from other vessels. And we turn that into an end user product that we make, make that data very accessible through our uh, web APIs in all kinds of you know, shapes and forms. And we add additional services like predictive um, analytics, you know, telling you where a ship will be most likely with some sort of confidence interval hours uh, hours from now. So you know, if you report, you might want to know how busy it's going to be in a few hours. We're starting to add these kinds of features as well. And could you tell us a bit more about the software-defined sensors that are being used in your uh, spacecraft? Yeah, yeah, for sure. So I think for us and, and for lots of other new space companies or small set companies, this is a really essential building block and has been one of the enabling technologies to allow us to do what we're doing today. And, and really one of the strategic pillars that Spire was founded on was you know, we want to do things in a software defined way. We want to even build our processes based on software development, you know, iterative types of processes. So you, you can really exploit that, you know, that velocity uh, of development and that flexibility of deployment of various applications. We use software defined radios in general. We have, uh, they're all in-house, in-house designed and built. I, I know today there's, there's quite a bit available in the market. Back when we started, that was not the case. We had to um, we had to develop this ourselves, and we have I would say various computing platforms that we can use depending on uh, the needs for the sensor. Going from the low power, low low computing power, low uh, low power usage, all the way to you know GPU based. Um, heavy computing, heavy duty, FPGA, FPGA based um, systems and whatnot. And these are kind of standard computing systems that we've got sitting on the shelf. And then we combine them with the, the radio front ends that are kind of customized for most applications, although they're, you know, they're, they're, there's lots of overlap between the various applications. But um, yeah, so in any given satellite, we've got five or something uh, software-defined radios based on the amount of radios uh, and, and uh, payload sensors that we've got in there. And it's it's been really enabling, to give you an idea, over the course of the lifetime of our, our first couple of generations of satellites, we were able to improve the performance of the sensor by you know, orders of magnitude more than tenfold by just changing the software and the algorithms that, that run on the sensors um, without you know, touching the hardware, um, just by optimizing, uh, automating the DSP algorithms uh, and the control software. And Jaren, is the new space industry on a good path to democratize access to space? And what, what do you think is the biggest challenge uh, to this? Yeah, I think so. I mean, uh, it's really blossomed over the last couple of years. I think you know when when we started, there was there was kind of the first wave of companies uh, that went went to do a few applications. We spent you know some time getting our infrastructure off the ground, um, and we're now getting to a point that we're really uh, addressing market needs. Right? Just, I think there's a big difference between demonstrating something once with one or a couple of satellites. And actually building a um, operational product that has SLAs, that has you know 99% uptime, that has customer support. There's a really big roadmap uh, and a big list of things that has to happen um, between those two things. Um, it's something you know, that uh, that we've discovered. It might sound obvious, but we definitely learned it the hard way. Um, but, but we're now at a point where that exists for us. We can really build products now with our end users and our markets in mind that is based on much more than just the satellite data. You know, it includes uh, terrestrial data, it includes um, analytics models, uh, it includes machine learning models, really to serve the needs of the end, end user and the end customer. And I think that's that's also the biggest challenge, getting from this kind of demonstration level, you know, yes, this works, proof of concept uh, of a certain technology, 
to a, an operational product that um, you can get actual customers to sign up to, you can get recurring revenue, and you can really build, you know, build a business on. Um, I think that's, that's, that's been the big difference, it's been a, a big challenge. The other big challenge, um, I think, is to find, you know, is to find the markets. It's to find, you know, people outside the space industry that are willing to pay for this data where you're actually adding value to their operations and their systems. You want to be able to, you know, convince the people that really don't care about space that your product will improve you know, their workflow or their decision making or save them money or you know, whatever it is. And so that's uh, that's been the other challenge for us. And I think for you know, for a lot of the, the companies that are trying to build out and demonstrate uh, technologies now, that, that will also be a challenge. Thank you so much for your time, Jaren. This has been very interesting. Uh, best of luck with everything you do at Spire. Goodbye. Yeah, bye.